right, folks. Thank you for coming. My name is Jason Fox. I'm the chair of the graphic design department uh, based in Savannah. Um, uh, our guests and I have come up uh, for a, a reason, and uh, that reason is, is, is uh, pretty simple. And um, this, this particular uh, event, the series of events we've been running the entire winter quarter, you can go watch all of these videos at the SCAD Virtual Lecture Hall, these conversations. We started in week two with Matthew Manos, um, of 37, I'm sorry, of e a very nice uh, dot com uh, who wrote how to give half of your work away for free. Uh, we then moved into a conversation with Jason Freed of 37 Signals who founded Basecamp. Um, we then moved into Tiffany Schlain um, who is a co-founder of the Webby Awards. Uh, our last one two, uh, two weeks ago was with Miss Lana Rigsby of Rigsby Hall in Houston, Texas, ranked one of the 50 most influential design firms in the last 50 years by Stephen Heller. And we've culminating, we're culminating all of this here in Atlanta because the How Design Live conference is going to be hosted here in Atlanta May 19th through the 23rd. And more importantly, because SCAD's involvement in it as the executive education sponsor is extremely important to us to make sure we had a, a, a wonderfully prominent alumni, uh, specifically with graphic design, and that is our guest today, Ms. Kate Aronowitz. So with that said, I'm going to introduce our MC for the night, Ms. Elise Benin, Program Coordinator for the How Design Live Creative Entrepreneurship Track at the conference. Elise. Thank you, Jason, and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We have a lovely audience of students here, and we are in Atlanta, at the Atlanta campus of the Savannah College of Art and Design. And uh, this is, as Jason said, How Design Live at SCAD 2016. It's a lecture series. And uh, it's one of the elements of the executive, sponsor executive education sponsorship of SCAD and How Design Live. And my name is Elise Benin. I'm the programming partner for the Creative Entrepreneur Program at How Design Live. And the goal of this lecture series is to introduce creative visionaries and design leaders to the world and to the students. And we've chosen ones who have built on their education, their design education in particular, and are using their creativity to do something meaningful, something that they're passionate about. And everyone that we've chosen has had all of those elements. So this is the fifth of five presentations, and you can see them all at the SCAD Virtual Lecture Hall. And uh, we're leading up to the big conference, the How Design Live conference in May, which is happening May 19th through 23rd here in Atlanta. And for this final presentation, we've chosen a very special speaker, a SCAD alum, Kate Aronowitz. She's from the graphic design department, and she is VP of design at wealthfront.com. So before we say hello to Kate, I want to just read you a little bit about where she comes from and where she's been. As Wealthfront's VP of Design, Kate Aronowitz leads the design team to ensure that products go beyond utility to delight clients. Prior to joining Wealthfront, Kate held leadership positions at three multi-billion dollar software companies. She joined Facebook as its director of design in 2008 and contributed to building a world-class team of designers, researchers, engineers, and content strategists. Prior to Facebook, Kate was hired as LinkedIn's first director of design. Kate began her design career at Amerifit Brands, designing retail corporate identity and packaging, but her focus on interactive and UX began when she joined eBay in 2000. Kate has been named to Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business, and she holds a BA in graphic design from SCAD. So welcome, Kate. Thank you so much for joining Hi. us. Thanks for having me. Of course. And uh, I need to see Kate, please. I don't know if uh, you can get me up on this, get her up on the screen for me, please. So Kate, thank you for taking the time today to join us. Of course. And uh, I want to talk first about your foundation, your design foundation. Because I saw and read somewhere that you uh, started at SCAD as a fashion design major and then moved into graphic design. Tell us about what you anticipated, what you thought you were going to do, and how that changed. So the first thing to do, so 
Thank you for having me and, and hi everybody. Uh, the first thing to do is to set context. So this was the mid nineties. Um, there was no email on campus. I think email came about my last year there. I never had it because I thought that that was for more advanced students, so I had no <laughs> technology. Um, so when I came to SCAD, um, I'd fallen in love with the town. Um, I originally had started at Syracuse University. My parents didn't support me going to art school. Came to SCAD, talked them into letting me come there. Um, really wanted to have a degree in fashion, but quickly learned that it was more of a passion and not something I liked having pressure applied on me to do. It was, it was a hobby and I, I didn't like my classes and I frankly wasn't a very good student. Um, but there were a couple of computer labs, I think over in, at the time it was Preston Hall, probably not that anymore, <laughs> but, um, and just these, a few rooms of, of Macs. And uh, I took like a typography class and just fell in love with graphic design. I liked the problem solving. I liked the immediacy of being on the computer and I liked the control. And I also felt like it had real purpose rather than just doing something for myself. So I switched to graphic design pretty late. It was probably not until my junior year. I had to do an extra semester to get caught up. But uh, once I locked in over there, I had straight A's. I was a much better student and uh, really, really loved the program quite a bit. And what did you think you would do with your de degree? Um, so I was hoping to marry the two and go to New York and work at a fashion magazine. It's still a dream of mine. It didn't happen. Um, but what was funny is I, uh, I went to New York and I lasted two weeks <laughs> on a couch of a fellow SCAD grad. She had a job at Calvin Klein and I was very excited about that, but I really realized she was giving underwear to celebrities and it wasn't much design going on. So <laughs> I got freaked out and went up actually to another SCAD uh, fellow alum uh, was in Connecticut and ended up there for a summer and um, joined um, Amerifit, which was a small company, but it gave me the opportunity to really do really good graphic design. I got to do advertising and identity and packaging and work with a really fantastic team. So in a very roundabout way, I did not do fashion magazines. <laughs> And I, I also remember hearing that uh, you were doing PowerPoint at one point and basically giving the advice like do just whatever they tell you to do, do whatever you can because that will, that's how you will get where you need to go. Yes, absolutely. So um, reality took a different turn. Um, my then boyfriend, now husband was living in California and I moved out here to be with him and I didn't have any experience in websites at all, no technology. Um, and those were the only jobs that were available, but eBay was hiring someone to do PowerPoint design, not something I wanted to do, but eBay was growing. It had fantastic people and a great mission. And I thought I've got to just join this company and do whatever it takes to get my foot in the door. So I designed a really, a lot of really boring PowerPoints and sales presentations. Um, but at the same time, they were forming their first user experience team. Uh, which was pretty rare out here at the time. And I kind of just went over there and made myself indispensable. I did production graphics for them. Again, whatever it took um, to one, build relationships, two, build trust, and three, just understand the craft from the ground up, knowing that I, I couldn't go in and design a product, you know, a really strategic one yet. It was much more valuable to get in and almost work as an apprentice under someone else, which I feel like is kind of a lost art form or people wanting to do that anymore. So, yeah. yeah. It seems that way to me too. Certainly not any of these students in the room, but I've heard about students who come out of school and basically want to go straight to the coolest yes. projects in the company. And when they don't get that, they leave. Yes. I've seen that many times. <laughs> and it's disappointing actually, because I, I actually think if you get in with the right person, you know, the right manager, I've got two new grads looking at working for me right now, and I know what they want to do at the end of the day. And one of them is now working on her first big project. But to start out with, it was much more important for her to literally do like production on mobile screens mm -hmm. and get her hands dirty in other people's work. Excellent. All right. So just one last question before we move on, yeah. you know, looking at your history, as you've described it, would you have done anything differently than what you did? Um, I would think about this. I actually don't think I would have. Um, 
it would would be fun to say I would have stuck it out in New York a little bit longer, but then I wouldn't be doing what I, I do now and I'm and I'm happy doing it here. We can get into the advice later, but I think it all ties into being very deliberate with every job you take mm -hmm. and that way you can feel good about you know what you've done um, and that it was always leading to the next step. Great. So let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now because sure. first tell us what exactly it is. So what Wellfront is? What what <laughs> yeah, Wellfront is not and as what well you're recognizes doing. Is, is Facebook or or eBay. And again, that was very deliberate. So after being at Facebook and building a giant team and, and really having a great time there, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to go into an area where I felt like design had yet to make a big difference. So Wealthfront is, the mission of the company is to bring sophisticated financial advice to everyone. So there are very you know, few people in the country right now who have a lot of money who get the best financial advice. And frankly, we think that everyone deserves it and we wanna do it through technology. Um, and so as their VP of design, you know, the company is only about 120 people. The design team's about five. Uh, it's my first executive role that's broader than just design. So it's also a chance to bring design to a company across the company to help build it. So I'm helping to design how we review people, how we think about our culture. I help design the workspace, um, just bring, being able to bring design to just about everything we do. Okay, so I'm not a designer. So if you would be as specific as you can about any one of those examples, like bringing design to the culture, what exactly does that mean? How do you do that? How does it manifest? <laughs> um, so I think, you know, design thinking is very oriented around looking at needs and then problem solving, I think, in a creative way that's very collaborative. Um, and, you know, when we went to so when you get a job, people give you a performance review. They tell you you're doing well, you're not doing well, right? And that's a really important part of someone's career. And instead of just getting a form offline and filling it out and giving it to someone, last year I sat down with everyone and really designed the process on how people were gonna get feedback. What did the form look like that they were gonna do, you know, fill out? Um, would people feel more comfortable giving feedback in person? So it was almost like designing a service, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, but putting it into different parts of the business. Um, as we are looking into new business lines right now, I'm running a lot of the brainstorms and we're doing kind of design sprints across the company to figure out what are some of those new possibilities. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's fun to be able to kind of introduce those processes to other people, engineers, finance people that, that have not had it before. And one of the threads through this whole series has been the idea that design is much more than just the artifact, the deliverable that comes at the end of it. And that there's, as you mentioned, design thinking and service design and this idea of integrating design into the process. And it sounds like you're really doing that. So- We're trying. <laughs> yes, trying. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how design students should think about that? Because it seems like it's very easy to be oriented on the object that comes out of the process, but how do you approach it knowing that maybe all that's gonna come out of it is a conversation or uh, as you said, a process? H how can we think about that differently? Um, I think you, you kind of said it. I, you know, there are obviously um, processes that you guys are all learning right now about taking constraints or a problem and solving them with design. And I think you'd be amazed at how often you can apply that in your everyday life um, and, and just trying to do that across the board and, and bringing other people along. Like, you know, as a designer at, you know, at school, you're used to critique, you're used to explaining your ideas in a particular way, you're used to kind of bringing other people along with you. And that's a really powerful skill. Um, I found that, uh, you know, one of my most powerful classes I took was my portfolio class my senior year because it really taught me how to think about how to talk about my work. What were my goals? What was my thinking? How to bring other people along? What did success look like? I mean, those are powerful skills and, and a lot of other people actually don't have them and you can utilize them in many ways outside of just thinking about, you know, where to push your pixels or, or where to apply lines. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, it looks like you know, design is becoming not only more trendy, but more prevalent in the business world. And more and more companies are hiring designers. And I know that IBM, for example, is in the process of not only hiring 1,200 designers, but also trying to reorient the whole company and the culture of the company around this idea of design and design thinking. And I want to quote something I read that you said, which is that there's, no, there's just no shortage of companies out there trying to fill design leadership positions right now. So I wonder, you know, from your experience as a designer now in the boardroom on the, on the corporate level, can you elaborate on that and, and what you see happening out in the job market and in the corporations that are committed to design? Sure. So there's there's it's a multi part kind of answer. Um, there's the demand right now, and then there's frankly the lack of supply of design leaders, and why I think that's happening. Uh, the the demand is great. It's good for all of us. Uh, you know, when I started at eBay, so many of the conversations were, "Why is design important? Why should I invite the designer to the meeting? How can I get my foot in the door?" And now, like that, that's not happening as much anymore. Um, and I, I personally trace this back to kind of the iPhone, right? We've all got really great design in our pockets and, and just consumers demand great design anymore. There's just no excuse for not having it anymore. So everyone knows that design and client experience, user experience, whatever you want to call it, has to be fantastic. And in many cases can be a differentiator. And so that's kind of everyone realizing it's important. Then you kind of get to the middle part, and I talk to companies a lot about why they really want design in place and what their design culture is, not just saying we need design, but really understand how is it going to function in your business. The way design functions at Wealthfront is very different than the way design functions at Facebook. So I talk a lot to companies about what do you really mean when you say we embrace design? And we can get into you know some details there. Uh, but the last part is... Uh, I'm helping some companies right now, you know, probably apps that you guys use all the time and I can't say, but <laughs> they're all looking for heads of design and there's, there's too few of us out there. Mm. And so I'm working with a program right now to try to one, identify why there aren't enough design leaders out there and two, try to cultivate kind of the next generation. Um, I think there's a, a large fear when I talk to people about when you kind of work your way up the leadership, uh, ladder you like I don't design anymore actively and you get further and further away from the craft and and how to talk to people about how that can be okay and 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 how to go go to that and become more of a facilitator and, and be okay with that so um you mentioned this lack of people who are positioned essentially to become design leaders that makes me wonder what are the qualities of a design leader besides the fact that you're not really designing anymore and I'm sure it has to do with design thinking but what are these companies looking for in the leadership that they need for this type of new position so um some of the best designers I know are so focused on their craft and that's what makes them good. That's why I hire them. That's why they're better than I am. <laughs> but frankly, sometimes they're not as interested in the business. They don't stay after the meeting to talk to the business team and really understand the model, understand what we're trying to do, understand the goals. They don't want to go talk to the engineers about how things are going to be built. They aren't as interested in actively getting out and talking to clients and users. You know, it's about broadening yourself out across a business. Um, and I think that that's the way that people tend to differentiate themselves into a leader. It's not just about going in and knowing the best design decision to make. It's about being a really good facilitator and someone that can kind of be a connective tissue across companies or across teams at companies. Um, and there are a lot of designers that frankly, you know, they, they would rather not do that. And that's okay. Like they want to stay at their, you know, at their machine and, and, and really kind of perfect things. Um, and that, and that's okay. But it is kind of a, a branch out um, from doing that to, to make the conscious decision to go into management and, and lead teams. It, it's looking at things very differently. And it sounds like you're talking about 
uh, a need for curiosity and interest in things that are beyond what I would call creativity. And that was one of my questions for you too, is do you distinguish between the creative side and the business side? Because I come across a lot of people who think they are in conflict, that you can't have one and the other or do one and the other without them corrupting each other. How do you think about that? Um, I, I disagree with that. I, I kind of don't distinguish between the two. I mean, mm -hmm. there's design and art for art's sake, but then there's design within a business context and design with a purpose. And all the business is, is setting up the problem and design is your solution. Mm -hmm. And without constraints, like, I don't know, I, I think constraints are really interesting for designers, actually. I mean, that's what makes us better. That's the challenge. Um, so a designer who isn't really interested in solving a real problem when they've been hired at a company. I always tell people, I'm like, you're not here for yourself, you're here for the company. Um, it's very hard in my mind to separate it out. And I think that designers that embrace that rather than resist it uh, tend to do a lot better in the long run. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, getting into the details about how design is done or thought about differently between Wealthfront and Facebook or even LinkedIn. I'd be curious to know how that is different. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. So my first job out here was at eBay, um, and that was very much a learning experience for me. And at the time, the technology was so new to just allow someone to get online and buy and sell something that it was so, we were barely thinking about visuals. We were just trying to get people through these really complicated flows. I mean, at the time there were no modals, there was no rich technology. It was, how do you get somebody through a 17 step listing an item flow? I mean, it really made you think deeply about interaction design that, and that was kind of eBay. Um, at LinkedIn, uh, the next kind of interesting problem to solve online was dealing with people and their identity and how they saw themselves digitally. I mean, at the time it was, provocative to put a profile picture on your resume and now you can't think about it any other way. So it, at LinkedIn, it was very much focused on identity. And at Facebook, it was, you know, designing for the world. When I joined, um, Mark Zuckerberg was a very big supporter of design. And he said, you know, you've got to design for billions of people and, and thinking about it that way. And he said, I want you to go hire the biggest and the best design team in the world and to be able to put all that together and have it embraced and, um, and really think about design as a utility for all of these people was, was a really exciting uh, you know, place to be, but very different than where I'd been before. Mm -hmm. Sounds like, and so now let's go back to Wealthfront, what you're doing there. And um, the CEO said, Kate will be joining our executive team to ensure that design is incorporated, in, incorporated into every decision we make. And I'm curious how what you learned at SCAD prepared you for Sorry, my light went off here. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, my light went off in my room here. I just turned it back on. Okay. So what did I learn? What, what is it that you learned at SCAD that prepared you for the design leadership position and especially you know, to be incorporating design into every decision that they make at Wealthfront? Wealthfront? Um, so at Wealthfront, I'll start with the, the Wealthfront piece first. So again, getting back to the core of design and finance, um, if you log on and look at your online banking account or look into your phone to pay a bill, I mean, it's very clear that no one is really putting the de design at the center of any of that. Mm -hmm. um, money is emotional, it's personal, and a lot of people are deeply intimidated by it when frankly they shouldn't be, a lot of very smart people are. And we think we can use design to build tools to change that. So that's where design is kind of sitting at the core of our business. Um, but, you know, every Monday I go into the executive meeting, there's only, you know, eight of us. And, you know, we're talking about everything from what's our hiring process to what business lines are we going to go with, go into and, and back to our culture again. Mm -hmm. um, and, so it, it's, it's fun to be able to apply my skill set across there. The other exciting thing here is that at some companies, um, this is a good question for you guys to ask when you're interviewing, ask like, where do ideas come from at your company? 
And if they don't say that a designer can come up with an idea, you should run. So um, here the designers are also just actively coming up with ideas. It's not just about one team saying, okay, guys, go, here's a wireframe, go build this. My team is actively, we just had a brainstorm this morning, coming up with feature ideas and we're seen as equals with the engineers and the other product people. Mm -hmm. So it's fun to be in an environment that's like that, where ideas truly can come from my team. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other element of this mission for this series has to do with uh, basically bringing your creativity to something that you're passionate about. And I've heard you also talk about design with a purpose. And I wonder, does this go toward what you're doing at Wealthfront or beyond that? How do you think about designing with a purpose? Um. Yeah, I think what I just talked about, I think I definitely feel like design has a purpose here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when you go out as a designer, not every designer has the exact same interest. You can tell by your portfolio or what jobs you're interested in. One of my passions has been to uh, mentor and bring other designers together. So regardless of what other, whatever company I was working at, to kind of assemble and mentor these teams along and uh, get them interested in business and have them be awesome at problem solving. That's truly a passion of I have just coming out of design. And it's been really, really important to me. Mm -hmm. And let's see, you mentioned uh, some, we'll get to the advice section. So I think I'm gonna, we're gonna open it up to questions soon. So be thinking about questions out there, but what advice do you have for students going out and into this job world, into this changing economy with all the technology, what you learn in school is probably gonna be obsolete by the time you get to a job and try to use it. So, so um, what advice do you have for students? Uh, I was telling Elise that I had to leave a meeting early today to get here and we were just reviewing student portfolios for internships. So I just looked at about 25 portfolios and tossed, unfortunately, about 21 of them. And so four of them have made it through to the, the next round. So a lot of this advice is going to sound very um, simple and elementary, but you'd be surprised at how often people don't follow it. I would be extremely deliberate about anything you put out there online. People can find your work if you put it out there. Um, I'll see a portfolio that has like two really good projects and then three that just look like, oh, look, I had a bunch of post-its, isn't that impressive? You know, lots and lots of wireframes without a lot of purpose. Like be very deliberate about what you put out there um, and also really talk about what you are trying to accomplish. People are impressed with process, but they're more impressed with results. So I see a lot of portfolios right now that look like they're built around very fancy processes. And I don't have time to read through all of that. And I want to make sure that whatever they got to at the end, the process is all for naught if it's, if it's not a good, you know, end result. So I look very closely at that. Um, visuals matter a lot, at least to me, you need to let people know that, you know, your spacing, your kerning, your typography choice, that you care about every last detail. Detail matters big time. So that's your portfolio. Um, and then I think as you're going out, what's interesting, um, I actually give a lot of students advice about be careful about being lured into what seems to be more of a leadership position early on. There are a lot of uh, small startups and stuff where you could be offered, you're going to be the first designer or you're going to be the second designer. Make sure you set yourself up in a place that will be a really good place for you to learn. Um, don't join a company where you don't see someone there that you admire and you wouldn't want to emulate. Um, don't just go to like the salary or the title, like really think about exactly what you want to get out of each position that you took. Like eBay, I knew designing PowerPoints was, wasn't what I wanted to do, but I knew that there were smart people there. It was a growing business and it was the right way to get my foot in the door. At the same time, I had an offer for a much more senior position in a small company, but you know, it just wasn't that interesting. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I would ask, you know, when you, when you join, ask where design idea, where ideas come from, I would also ask if they're set up to teach and, and help people right out of school. Um, at Facebook, my first two years there, I turned away a lot of new grads. I said, frankly, I don't think I can spend enough time with you to make this worth your while. 
until we could put in a really robust program. Uh, I had two interns last summer. One clearly needed a lot more handholding and I couldn't do that. And I felt really bad that I had hired her. Mm. So it's okay to know what you want and what you need and, and go after it. The job market is really robust right now and you should be able to find exactly what you want. You should be pretty picky. You know, one of the other threads through this series also is the idea of being able to write well and communicate clearly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of designers sometimes think, oh, well, I'm a designer, I'm a visual person, I'm not a writer. But more and more, especially with email, everything has to be written. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, are you also, when you're looking at resumes, when you're looking at cover letters or cover emails, looking at the writing and seeing how clearly people express themselves? I think so, yeah. Like I said, whenever you're showing your portfolio, I would very clearly at the top, what is the purpose of the project? How long did it take? Uh, did you, what was your role? Did you collaborate with other people? What was the result? Um, if you can clearly and concisely, you know, explain that, I'm, I'm more impressed than with someone that, that can't. Um, this morning, one of our designers actually was writing up, we're, we're going through a rebrand right now and it's not enough to just show what we're going to do. We, she had to kind of write this manifesto about why we're changing, where we're going. We feel like we're very technology centric right now. We want to be more personal. We want to be more friendly. We want to be warm. Um, and the fact that she could write this really lovely document to go along with her work when we went to present to the CEO made all the difference. Mm. And what about presentation and skills too? I mean, that seems like something as you climb the leadership ladder also, you have to be very comfortable getting up on a stage and being live and being online and all of that. So I actually think it's one of the most important skills. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a single person that I've ever hired that I didn't make give a presentation. So from interns, I the first thing I say is um, I give people very loose requirements. I say, okay, there's gonna be this many people in the room, here's roughly what they do. You have an hour, here's the technology, go. And I wanna see what they present. Um, you know, how do they talk about their work? Mm -hmm. How, you know, are they, are they selfish? Do they give credit to others? Are they willing to show work that they're not that proud of, but they thought had a lot of purpose? Do they leave time for questions? You know, do they stand up straight? <laughs> All those mm -hmm. kinds of things, because um, there's no company where you can just send your work over email. You have to go in and actively sell yourself to other people. Um, and, and by far heads and above anyone else, I can look at two portfolios, but if you're a better presenter, you will get the, you will get the job. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Now, um, you seem like a very outgoing person. Were you always this way or were you an introvert at some point and you had to grow out of that? I'm for, more of a forced extrovert at work. I'm very quiet at home. <laughs> so. yeah. Um, I, I think I skipped over something you asked me earlier about kind of what SCAD taught me at the end. And really, uh -huh. honestly, it was just the last quarter I was there, but there was such a focus on portfolio review. I don't know if I'm, I'm sure you guys must do this now, but, you know, at the time, all of our portfolios were printed and mounted on blackboards and we'd get dinged if something like the, the professor would come up and measure our boards. And if they weren't cut right, he would get out of here, you can present next week. And if you stumbled over your words, if you didn't know what you were doing, it was get out of here, come back next week. Um, I, you know, I'm not perfect, I, you know, I, it's, it's hard to do this kind of stuff, but the more you can get comfortable talking about your work and bringing others along, it's, 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 it's really good. Mm -hmm. You know, find a mentor, explain your work to your dog, to your husband <laughs> wife before you go in. <laughs> I love that. Um... And you talked also about the relationships that you've built over the course of your career. And that implies networking and that implies staying in touch with people and that implies being an extrovert. So maybe you have some networking tips also that you can share, I hope. Uh, sure. Um, so it will happen. You will get a design job and there will be clashes between designers and either engineers or like, it's just always, <laughs> We can be a picky bunch sometimes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, relationships don't always go super well, uh, but it was interesting at eBay, uh, just to share a story. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the marketing design team. We did a lot of visual designs and we had these reviews every Monday morning with the business team and they always tore our work to shreds. 
and the designers would yell and scream. It was, it was pretty bad. They'd stomp out of the room. It was always bad. But I was always the one that would go back over and make peace and say, how can we solve this better? How is this going to work out? We can't work this way. It's not good for us and it's not good for the business. Mm. Um, and, I, and I did that quite a bit um, while I was there. And sure enough, years later, the woman who I had worked with to do that remembered that I had done that. Mm. And she was at Facebook and was the one that called me and said, Kate, I want you to come to Facebook because the designers are unruly. They don't come into work. I need someone that can come in and like, build relationships and like, wow. you know, with, with other people in the company and, and make, you know, design, you know, build the reputation back up again. So, um, yeah, I would build strong relationships throughout your career for sure. I mean, one of the agency's jobs I got um, in Connecticut, I had gotten a call from a girl who sat next to me at SCAD in one of my classes. Mm -hmm. She was like, oh, I remember you were really cool and you liked this kind of stuff. Would you want to come in and interview? And I, and I ended up working there for two years. So I definitely stay in touch with people. And are you still in touch with a lot of people that you knew here at SCAD? A handful, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Excellent. All right, just a couple more questions, and then we're going to open it up. Um, who are your guides and mentors now? Um, so this kind of changes throughout the year, um, or not throughout the year, but but throughout time. Um, I'm a big believer that it's kind of awkward to just go to someone and say, "Will you be my mentor?" Mm -hmm. Like it's very, I find it very flattering when people have asked me that. But if I don't know you very well, it's hard for me to be your mentor. And I also, I'm more excited when someone comes to me with a really specific purpose. Like, Kate, can you mentor me on how to better present in a meeting? I'm like, cool, we can do that in a couple weeks and we can either maintain a relationship or not, we will accomplish something. So right now I have a couple people I'm going to. So um, our CFO here at the company, I didn't go to business school. I don't understand the business model. I don't know how to read a balance sheet and participate in meetings that way. And I've asked her, I said, you know, Ashley, will you spend an hour with me every other week to walk me through the balance sheet and teach me what these numbers mean? And I went to her with a very specific purpose. I write the agenda ahead of time. She knows what I'm asking her for. And it's been fantastic. Um, I would say, honestly, a mentor on my, is somebody on my team who reports to me right now. I'm not actively designing right now. And so he keeps me in touch with craft mm -hmm. and what's going on and challenges me on my feedback and critique. Like after critique, I go to him and I say, Josh, how did I do? What did you think? How could I better do things out there? Mm -hmm. um, there's another woman that I go to a lot who I just think has fantastic presence and she's very good at just asserting herself. And I write to her sometimes and say, hey, I've got to deliver this difficult message can you tell me how to do that and, and still feel okay with it? So it's, it's, for me, it's very purpose-driven. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you have to not be afraid to ask for help, basically, because I think a lot of people no. imagine, oh, they're not going to have time, they're not going to want to, they're not going to whatever. But, I almost, but again, I would add to that, always have a purpose. Be really specific. I'm asking you because I think you're good at that, mm -hmm. and I want to be better at that, rather than will you just be my mentor? Mm -hmm. Like. I get that's an awkward conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Final question. The best advice you've ever received. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, something I learned early on in my career and also at school was kind of not to mistake talent for hard work. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you all have people in your classes and you're like, oh my God, they're so talented. Like they were just born that way. Right. Or you'll, you know, I remember even getting my job at Facebook on people with Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg. And I'm like, oh my gosh, these people are just naturally so gifted and talented. And the answer is that yes, they are very smart naturally and everything, but anyone who's really good at something, they put so much time and hard work into it. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it. I mean, they have coaches, they go get advice from people, they rehearse things five times. They stay up late when they know a project isn't good. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other night I, I was preparing for a meeting um, and I went to bed, I had my notes all drawn up. It, I was presenting with two other women and I went to bed at 11 o'clock and I was like, it's not good enough. And I mailed them all at like 1130 at night. And I was like, we got to get back on the phone. It's got to be better. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so don't get discouraged. Sometimes I would think, God, I'm not as good as the people that are around me. And I, and I still feel that. But I think if you dig in, you find that it's actually a ton of hard work that goes in to uh, someone being successful or, or good at something. It seems like talent is the ticket price. I mean, that's a given that yeah. you're talented. And then over and above that, you have to work really hard. That has been yeah. a thread through this whole series, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. All right, any final words before we open it up to questions, Kate? No. Okay, good. Thank you. So let's see who we have in the audience has Kate questions for Kate, whether about anything she said, or even comments about what she said or what she hasn't said. And um, before you speak, just say who you are and what your degree is in or what you're studying. Hi, uh, my name is Joshua Neely and my major is advertising. And my question was, um, what were some of your challenges when working with your first design team and how did you overcome them to get where you're at? How did I overcome and get to where I'm at? Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the first time I was a manager, is that, is that kind of what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it was super scary. I remember my first time I was managing two people, that's it. <laughs> and I made sure that like, I had done their job before and I understood it very, very well. Um, but I remember walking in and feeling, you know, extremely, I'm like, I'm responsible for these two people right now. Um, if you've had work before, you know that a good boss or a bad boss can make or break things. Um, I think the biggest hurdle I had to get over was when you're managing other designers, you can't jump in and design by yourself. You can't do, jump in and do the work yourself. I compared it to kind of designing with your hands tied behind your back. Um, so I had to get very good at explaining um, ideas or asking lots and lots of questions, trying to lead them to a destination that I had in mind. Um, but also understand that I didn't have complete control and a lot of times the result wasn't going to be exactly what I wanted and I had to be okay with that. And I wonder, we have one more question, but let me just add something there. Uh, because I'm always trying to find ways to bring creativity to all aspects of business and life. And it seems to me as a manager, there are very creative ways to go about it. Would you say that's true? Do you experience it that way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I've read lots of management books and, and think about things a lot, but um, I, I always think about the individual and each person is very different and what motivates them is very different. Um, my team has been working extremely hard on a release we have coming up. So tomorrow we're all going to go to a lasagna making class. So, you know, like, <laughs> which is fun. Um, and I've had other teams that, you know, wanted to do printmaking or sometimes I'll just have everybody to my house mm -hmm. to change up the environment a little bit and let them feel a little more free to, uh, to express themselves. Um, yeah, I'm always trying to think outside the box because designers need space. They need they need inspiration. It doesn't just, you know, happen by force. And so I'm, I'm constantly thinking about how to get that for the team. How many people are you managing now? Just five. Five. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, here's another question. Hi, um, my name is Josh Berkeley. I'm majoring in motion media design. Um, I recently spoke to one of someone that really um, inspires me a lot. And he, he was telling me that he, he expects a lot from students in terms of not just technical skills, but also um, being able to manage things. And I, I hear that like from what you're saying as well. And um, he's been telling me that, you know, an end goal for you should be not just to be good at what you do, but also have that, that, that mentality to push instead of just being artistic um, and my, my personal goal is to be a creative director one day. So not just be able to do things, but also be able to orchestrate the people that do things. Uh, and, not, and not in like a, a way where you, know, you have control over things, but just being able to share that vision with other people and allow them to like take control of things. So a lot of what I'm doing right now is to find time to do personal projects with other students, as opposed to just doing projects on my own. Mm. And I've found myself, like right now I'm, I'm working on a project and I'm trying to be a creative director before I'm actually like in that professional role. So um, I'm trying to put myself in those situations where I'm 
creating a vision, but also sharing it with other people. And the question I have is like, how do you act in that position where you have a vision and you want to share it with people, but you don't want to like stick your hand inside of it too much where you take away like creative control from people. How do you balance being a leader and being a creative professional, you know? It's, it's a really good question. Um, and it takes, but it's good that you're getting started early. It takes <laughs> years and years. I'm still not fantastic. <laughs> um, I think, you know, you have to think long and hard about the problem that your team is trying to solve. And one, make sure that the team is really armed with all of the information that you have um, and learn how to ask really, really good questions. And again, learn what's gonna motivate the team. A lot of times I really try to dig in and understand what motivates the designers that I'm working with. Um, sometimes they want just want some recognition. Other times they want something that goes live. Other times they wanna work with someone else that's really interesting or they wanna work on a certain project. Um, before I get started on anything big, I take time out of the office and just try to get to know the people as individuals outside of the group. And I would suggest doing that with any designers you're working with, like really understand what they're bringing. And when you're in that situation, when you can call on someone and ask them a question, they remember that you remember your, you know, your conversation and you're utilizing them in a unique way. Um, that goes a long way to build trust. Um, Sometimes you, you know, a, a visionary isn't always how somebody that has the answers or is kind of standing in front of the group. Um, you know, a designer came to me the other day and she said, I really like that you're really quiet in our critiques and you really don't say much until the end. And it's usually just a question that I'll ask. Hmm. So um, don't feel pressure to have all the answers. Find out what motivates the people, understand the problem and be comfortable and adjust along the way, I would say. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Who else? We have a question over there. We have one over there too. Hello, Katie. It's Jason. Um, my question is for based on a comment you had earlier uh, when we when we started this, and that is, um, you seems to be doing some consulting work or working with some companies outside of Wellfront um, uh, with regard to their uh, strategic application to design through their organizations. What cues do you look for? Um, in a company that, that helps you reveal whether or not they're truly interested in strategic application of design throughout the organization and not just design as surface. That's interesting. I actually gave a talk last week and I had five questions. I'll see if I can remember them <laughs> to, to, to ask yourself to identify whether you really have a design culture or not. I think the first one is I'll go in and I'll say, um, how is design, um, how is it critical to your success? Is it a differentiator in your field? Like here at Wellfront, we absolutely believe design is gonna set us apart. Like there's, there's no question we can give you examples. Um, the other one is I ask them kind of, uh, where does design report into? Uh, you know, what team do they associate themselves with? Are they with somebody that can make decisions? Um, I'll ask them, when was the last time a designer had an idea that made a difference at the company? And if they can't come up with anything, I suggest that they go tap into that. Um, trying to think of the other questions. <laughs> um, you know, just asking very simple questions about where, you know, when was the last time they spent time with the designer? Like, I, you know, I, I um, I went in recently and met with the CEO of a, of a pretty cool app and he was, oh, I love the design team. And I was like, oh, well, when did you spend time with them last? And it was very clear he didn't really even know their names. Like he just thought it was very cool. So, you know, do, idea, do designers contribute to ideas? Do they have leadership positions in the company? How is it a differentiator? And just get lots of examples like that. I would just ask lots and lots of questions. Beautiful. I can try questions? to find that slide and send it out. Yeah, that would be great. great. We'll add it. Okay, Jason has a follow-up. If I gave you three names and you had to pick one, Jim Alley, Jim Bostwick, or Dan <laughs> Tazi. Dan. <laughs> nice. That's an inside Well, joke. he ran That's my portfolio joke. class. That's He's just the one measuring my boards yeah. and telling me I wasn't That's good right. enough. He's the he one was very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 
Excellent. All right. Any final questions? All right. We've got kind of a quiet group here, but thank you for those who That's did okay. ask questions. All right. Kate, any final words from you? No, good luck. And uh, if you end up out here in the Bay Area, find me. I'm always hiring and looking for good people. Oh, so. interesting. All right. So my thank yous. Thank you to Kate, especially for sharing your time and your experience and your ideas. I want to thank the team here at SCAD from Dean Rojas and Dean Fisher and Jason Fox and his team and the AV team up there in the window. And I also want to thank the How Design Live team, Gary and Amy and uh, Amanda. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And we hope to see you in Atlanta, May 19th through 23rd at How Design Live. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Ha, 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 ha.